Hello everybody and welcome to the latest video in our series of videos on political developments in Ireland in the 20th century. As always we begin with our learning outcomes so by the end of this presentation you guys should know who set up the GAA and why the GAA was set up. You guys should be able to outline the early decline and the gradual rise of popularity of the GAA and finally you guys should be able to give examples of the GAA's links to the nationalist tradition in Ireland. We have studied and looked at the famine and with the devastating effects of the famine and immigration we discussed the Irish diaspora. So with people leaving the country so much parents began to encourage their children to speak English instead of Irish. Uh, they did this in an attempt to give their children better prospects of finding a job either at home uh, in Ireland or when they would inevitably uh, travel abroad. There was also at this time there was a growing influence of English sports so sports like soccer and rugby were becoming quite popular within the country. This movement towards the English language and English games and culture is known as Anglicization and this is the imitating of English literature, music, games, dress, ideas and language. So new cultural organisations were set up within Ireland to try to protect Irish culture and identity from this Anglicisation. One of these is the GAA. Now the GAA was founded by this man here, Michael Cusack. Uh, Michael Cusack, he moved to Dublin in 1887. He moved there to set up an academy to try to prepare students for the civil service. Part of the academy um, curriculum would have included um, sports. Um, at the beginning, soccer and rugby were very popular. As time went on, he wanted to promote Irish sports like hurling and Gaelic football. But he noticed that the rules needed to be standardised as there were different rules in different parts of the country. So on October the 11th, 1884, he wrote an article called A Word About Irish Athletics. Uh, so this appeared in the United Irishman, which was the Home Rule Party paper. If you remember, this would have been at the height when William O'Brien was in charge of the paper um, that was owned by... Uh, primarily by, by Charles Stuart Parnell and also would have been published in The Irishman. These articles were supported a week later by a man called, by, by a letter from a man called Morris Davin. Now Morris Davin was a world famous Irish athlete and he held the numerous world records in athletics at the time so he was really a well respected figure in the country. So him throwing his weight behind Cusack's um, call towards a standardisation uh, of Irish athletics really gave weight to it. So on the 1st of November in 1884 Michael Cusack convened the first meeting of the Gaelic Athletic Association. Um, so this was known as the Gaelic Athletic Association for the Preservation and Cultivation of National Pastimes. They met in Hayes Commercial Hotel in Thurlis. Um, Davin um, was elected as president and Cusack really did a good job of attracting people from different walks of life. So four of the seven founders at the meeting were Fenians. Uh, remember the Fenians had a rebellion uh, in 1867. We see the power of John Devoy with Clon the Nail when we're looking at Charles Stuart Parnell. Um, and he also got people like the Archbishop uh, Croak of, of Cashel. He got Charles Stuart Parnell and he got Michael Davitt to be patrons or the people to give money to the GAA. These three men, they represented some of the most powerful organisations within the Irish country at the time. Archbishop Croke represented the church. Charles Stuart Parnell was at the forefront of Irish politics. And Michael Davitt, was the, who had been the leader of the Land League, was really at the front of rural Irish concerns and um, programmes at the time. Once the GAA met, it spread very quickly. Uh, initially, athletics was the most popular sport, but soon, pretty soon, hurling and football became the most popular sports 
within the GAA. And by 1887, only a couple of years after that meeting, there were 635 Gaelic Athletic Association clubs set up around the country. The first All-Ireland Football and Hurling Championships Championships took place in 1887. So while this was a, an initial good start, there were some early setbacks for the GAA that really threatened to derail the whole thing. One of the biggest things was the American Invasion Tour of 1888. So this was an attempt to, to raise money in America. So they sent 50 Irish athletes over to embark on a fundraising tour um, of Irish centres uh, in America. They would go over there, they would have displays of hurling and athletics and, and, and these international contests between the Irish and the Americans over there, but it, it was a complete disaster. There was a lot of fighting went on over there. Some of the men never even came back to Ireland uh, and the GAA had to borrow £450 from Michael Davitt to bring the rest of them home, as I said, and 17 of them remained in America. Another big blow to the GAA was that there was the split in the Home Rule Party. When um, Parnell's career took a downturn after the O'Shea affair and after his death, there were massive divisions within the Home Rule Party. And it really split the country in, in, in a certain way. And it caused divisions within the GAA. So by at Parnell's height in 1890, there were about 900 clubs. Um, and three years later, it had dropped to 118 clubs. However, it wasn't dead yet, and there was a revival in the fortunes. And some of the things that helped to really revive it was the first thing was the establishment of the all Ireland Finals. So as I said before, the first all Ireland Finals were held in 1887. There was no all Ireland in 1888, but after that, there has been one. Uh, every year, uh, even this year, 2020, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic that's going on, there is an attempt to make sure that the All-Ireland is played this year. Another big thing that turned the fortunes of the GAA was the purchase of Croke Park. Croke Park today is, is a tourist site, is a magnificent stadium within Dublin City, within Dublin City. Um, and the GAA purchased these playing fields and they were named after Archbishop Croke, who was one of those patrons, and that became the headquarters of the GAA and still is to this day. So the importance of Croke Park um, can be seen as a, as a cultural um, almost monument within the country. Um, there was new stands were built uh, with the Hogan stand built in the 1920s and this was named after the Tipperary player Michael Hogan who was killed by British forces on Bloody Sunday. Uh, this was when 14 people were killed by tanks and soldiers who uh, came in to Crow Park during the middle of a game between Tipperary and Dublin. Uh, the Cusack stand, named after the founder Michael Cusack, was built in the 1930s. And as Crow Park um, begins to grow, not only did it host the All Ireland Finals year, but it begins to have other famous sporting events like Muhammad Ali fights there against Al Lewis there in, in 1972. Now, the GAA had links to the nationalist traditions. As we said, the uh, four of the seven founding members were Fenians. And the GAA, along with other cultural nationalist institutions, which we look at the Gaelic League and the Anglo-Irish Literary Movement, they had links with nationalist and separatist groups like the Fenians or the IRB. And a lot of people who were in the IRA or the IRB or the Fenians also were members of the GAA. Now, there were some... Um, controversial things the GAA did. Uh, the GAA replaced restrictions on British culture and institutions. So RIC officers or the police at the time, they were not allowed to join the GAA. This was known as Rule 21 and this was brought in in, in 1897 and it wasn't taken out of the GAA rules until 2001. Uh, another one which was quite controversial was the GAA banned its members from participating in and watching foreign sports like rugby and soccer. Uh, this particular rule was known as Rule 27 and this was brought in in 1901 and again it was rescinded or, or taken back in 1971. So that brings us to the end of our presentation where we have looked at the founding of the GAA and some of the crucial moments uh, in its rise to the national um, 
cultural phenomenon that it is today. So you guys should now know who set up the GA and why. You guys should be able to outline the early decline and gradual rise in popularity of the GA. And finally, you guys should be able to give examples of the GA's links to the nationalist tradition in Ireland. So thanks for watching. Hope you guys got something good from this video.